Welcome to a new episode of Delphine Circle, where we uncover the mind, body, and spirit of success. Subscribe now for free to receive updates on the latest interviews. Then sit back, relax, and tune in. The essence of adventure and exploration is certainly found in both the destination and the journey. In early November 2019, I set out from San Diego, California in a twin turbine Commander 900 to attempt a pole-to-pole aviation first in an aircraft of this type. The journey comprises 26 nations across six continents. I'm also the first pilot to utilize only biofuels over the poles, and I'm carrying two state-of-the-art experiments from NASA and the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. One represents the future of space travel, and the other tests for atmospheric plastic pollutions across the globe. My mission is comprised of world firsts, important science, and most importantly, peace. From 35,000 feet, you see the world from an awe-inspiring lens. While on the ground, you learn from others what it means to be a citizen of the world, through their eyes, through their hard work, and their love for humanity. I've encountered many challenges from land, sea, and air, as the mission took me through South America, the South Pole, across the Atlantic, Africa, Asia, and into Europe. In February, the COVID-19 outbreak quarantined me in Spain. Sometimes I feel this dream to circumnavigate the Earth via the poles would never be fully realized. Yet despite the difficulties, I've seen the world unite as one global family to rediscover their greatest strengths, to share peace and love, and to overcome the seemingly insurmountable challenges that life throws our way. The journey continues. I fly from Iceland northward, hopefully Norway, the North Pole, and then south across North America to where it all began many months ago. I've learned each and every one of us share a unique and remarkable journey, a truly exciting adventure, as together we find our way forward through this life to inspire one another and achieve peace as citizens of the world. Hi, Robert. Welcome to The Circle. Hi, Delphine. It's nice to be here. Well, very excited to have you because I originally became familiar with you in an article that I had read about you in um, Medium, which I guess is like an online magazine. And your story is unbelievable. And I read your book, Zen Pilot, and oh my gosh, you are a very unique person. We'll, we'll, we'll say that. You're known as the Zen pilot because you are a notable pilot, um, an author, a speaker, uh, retired Navy officer, and a uh, residential real estate investor. <laughs> what are you doing in your free time, man? Well, you know, I think all those things sort of set me up so that we could start the foundation and go out into the world and be the example that we wanted to see. Well, Zen pilot, what does that mean to you? Well, you know, a Zen pilot is somebody who who goes out and takes chances in the world and attempts to make it a better place and draws together their resources and a team to support them and lives the spiritual concepts that we you know, often talk about. It's a unique combination, um, mixing spirituality with flying and aeronautics and not one that you normally see necessarily put together. Um, how did those come together for you? Well, my three passions uh, have been business, spirituality, and flying. And I was trying to find a way that I could incorporate all those things into my life. And the branding flying through life really brought those together. And going out into the world using an aircraft was really a vehicle for our message. And from the outside, you'd probably look in and say, oh, this is just somebody flying around having a good time. 
well, the citizen of the world and the spirit of San Diego, the two planes that we've used so far have been amazing tools to get our messages subtly, you know, out into the world. Because if you hit somebody with a spiritual message, sometimes it can be a little bit strong, but if you're out there living it, it's, it's easier to take it in. That's a very good point. I like that. So flying through life is your first, is your first book, correct? Right. Uh, let's put this out here, right here, so everybody can see it. Um, how to grow your business and relationships with applied spirituality. Tell me a little bit about what that book was about. I started my uh, graduate spiritual psychology studies, and you know we were learning different concepts, and I wanted to apply them in my business because I felt like I had hit a wall. And you know, gradually as uh, we would learn things, I'd go out into the business and give it a try, and the business tripled in size in the span of about three years. And I took that success that I had and wanted to give back in the world. So I wrote the book that you know details it point by point, but also wanted to be a living example and going out and doing something very difficult in the world, which was an equatorial circumnavigation, which show that those concepts worked. You know, they generated the resources of time and money to make those things happen. And it's a very big undertaking that you <laughs> that you did, and you wrote all about it um, in a very fascinating manner. So in 2015, you circumnavigated the world, right? Um, equator, equatorial, equatorially, <laughs> equatorial circumnavigation along the equator. Yes, and and that is the subject of your book Zen Pilot, your next book here. Right. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, Robert. I. When I first picked it up, I don't really know that much about aeronautics, and I don't even know if I have that much of an interest in it. So I was actually thinking, mm, I may or may not like this book, but it was riveting, and I enjoyed every bit of it. You're an incredibly good writer, and the way that you described what you were going through on this trip and um, how your spirituality helped to get you home safely, which is really a miracle. I already knew that you were still alive, but if I would have not known throughout the book, I would have been very, very worried about you. Um, where did that idea come from? Well, you know, it was funny because spiritual concepts people use in their daily life, but I think they're most important during very trying times. Mm -hmm. And it's really easy to sort of pass on them all when that's happening. And in Zen Pilot, you know, when the engine failed 14,000 feet over the Strait of Malacca and I was there by myself, um, it was one of those moments, you know, where you're living life at a intensity level that you don't normally get an opportunity to. And what I like to say is that these major events that have happened have sort of broken me. Mm -hmm. And in a spiritual concept, you could say they they break you open. Mm -hmm. And that lets the light in and there's an opportunity for growth on a level that you can't experience in most places. Um, the, one of the things that I thought was so, so interesting about the book is that, um, if this, if this would have been a movie, people would have said it was unbelievable because you didn't just have one near death experience. You had multiple near death experiences. And it was amazing how literally miracles were, were occurring to, to make you land safely and to still be able to sit here today and, and tell the story. So how do you how do you explain that to people in a way that people can understand? Because most people would say, oh, come on, guy. Like, obviously, it wasn't, you know, really, God was helping you. Um, even just me talking about this book to people, um, people say, oh, well, you know, it sounds like he's a really lucky guy. And I'm like, I, I actually don't think that luck was a part of it. I actually think he did have divine intervention. But to most people, that must be a very difficult concept to explain. You know, a lot of people would say if something happens uh, once, you're lucky. If it happens twice, you're really lucky. But when things happen, you know, five, six, seven times, it, it, you have to have another explanation. Mm -hmm. And I like to think that our mission was uh, inspired and it was meant to happen in the world and people needed to see somebody uh, being persistent. And, you know, there were times when I described it as cosmic torture but I think really that there were lessons in everything that happened and seeing somebody working through that and, you know, the most impossible uh, situations is inspiring. It, you know, I was constantly questioning how hard does this have to be, you know, like how much do I have to be put through? Um, 
but you know, we just persisted. Yeah. One of the um, stories you tell, which probably was the most difficult to, to read through, was your trip from India to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And um, it wasn't an incredibly long distance to fly. You flew many, many other legs that were longer, but this one specifically, you had um, plane failure. So could you describe that better to me? What happened on that? Yeah, what happened was uh, I had stopped in um, Malaysia for some maintenance on the plane, and it was about a midway trip around the world. And in the process of tightening one of the spark plugs, they dropped or they snapped one of the oil drain lines. So I took off and uh, the oil was slowly draining out of the engine. And the oil uh, controls the propeller, the pitch on the propeller and the engine. So at about 14,000 feet, you know, I saw an oil warning light flash and then all of a sudden the propeller oversped. And when it lost oil pressure, instead of having a pitch, it goes flat. So it's kind of like hitting a wall in the air mm. and the plane's decelerating. And I just remember, you know, going forward and hitting the seat belts and it sort of spun me to the side and I looked over and there was nobody there with me. And I just remember thinking, thank God I'm alone. Mm that moment and um you know there's a pause because you're panicking and you're having sort of a primal response mm -hmm. and you can feel the you know the sweat going down your back and um and then you just get on with it and i realized that i was in this situation that had four possible outcomes you know there's the death my death and the destruction of the plane there's uh the destruction of the plane and i'm injured um then the plane could be destroyed and I would survive or the plane would survive and I would survive. So it's kind of like you're in this game and it's going to unfold in the next five minutes. Mm -hmm. And you're, um, you know, hoping for the best, but in a situation like that, usually you end up somewhere in the middle. So, uh, you know, all my training was um, coming to, to play in that moment. And, um, you know, the oil was basically out of the engine and I was desperately trying to pump some more in and uh, setting the glide slope, hoping that, um, you know, I'd make it to the airport because I could have ditched in the water, which is not a good outcome, or in the jungle, which is worse because it's like hitting a wall, or take the chance and go the 19.6 nautical miles, you know, into an international airport with mm -hmm. planes landing every few minutes. So yeah, very high stress moment. What was so interesting in the book, and, you know, I don't know anything at all about flying, but you not only talk so specifically about what were the technical aspects of what you had to do in order to be able to get to where you needed to go, and you had to think very critically at a time when your body wants to just shut down with fear and panic and, you know, um, and you do such a great job of describing both, both about the technical aspects of what you had to do in order to fly the plane and what was going on with the plane, but also in terms of what emotionally was going on with you. And, and throughout the book, you do, um, you do a very precise job at really describing how your spiritual growth, um, the evolution of your spiritual growth over that time and what you had to come out of it. And it's funny because I felt like I grew out of it, you know, like coming out of that book, I actually felt like my spiritual growth had had come too because I got to live it through you. And it was so painful to read what you were going through. And yet I came out of it going, am I going to have to go through something, you know, this horrible in order for 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 me to get growth as well? Do you feel like suffering is, is required for people to grow? I don't think that suffering is required. You know, there's a concept called ease and grace. And it's a way to learn the lesson without dealing with that sort of pain and stress. Um, you know, the moments you're referring to, of course, are Zen moments. And in the book, Peace Pilot, it transitions uh, to peace moments. But, you know, in the moment, like when the engine failed, at first I thought, oh, my God, this plane is trying to kill me. Um, and then later I realized it was keeping me alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For, uh, you know, something more. Mm -hmm. So, and then that continued you know, into the uh, polar circumnavigation that happened about five years later, roughly. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it was in a way preparing, preparing me and my team for something bigger in the future. It was kind of a warm up almost. Which is just shocking to me because I haven't read Peace Pilot yet, but I was for sure hoping you were going to say, and I never would do that again. <laughs>
But you do in the, each chapter with a Zen moment, um, which is kind of an excerpt of the lesson learned. Um, let me read one of them. Sure. I ceased to pray for safety, but instead I asked for whatever was intended for my highest learning to happen. This was surrender in its purest form. It scared me deeply, but I also knew the biggest learning lesson of my life was unfolding right in front of my eyes. How many times do you think that, how many times did you think you were going to die on that trip? I think there was five or six, if I, you know, as I think back to 2015. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting because when you're in those stressful moments, there's certainly learning that can happen. And sometimes it happens when you're by yourself you know, in remote parts of the planet and in extreme situations, you know, that's when you usually hear people talking about what they learned. It's not like, oh, I had this great time and I learned this. Mm -hmm. No, it was like, oh, I struggled, you know, mm -hmm. and um, you sort of go inside yourself and try and find that peace that you need, mm -hmm. um, you know, that maybe you don't know you have. That's so true. Um you were in the Navy for 14 years. You retired a lieutenant commander. Four of them were in active service. How Do you feel like your military training helped you with what you went through? You know, it's funny because I felt like my life really began when I started that trip. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the time in the Navy, dealing with high stress situations during the Gulf War, um, learning watch standing skills and the technical side of, um, you know, navigation and communications. Uh, and then later the success in my business all contributed, you know, to the success of these trips. Mm -hmm. And if you sort of dissect it, you see that all the skills were being built. So sometimes, you know, when I was maybe doing something I didn't like in small business, it was really preparing me for what was to come. Yeah. Well, you talk about going back to the Middle East and going back to a place in the, that you were stationed or very close to where you were stationed and kind of seeing it through new eyes. It was that because of your spiritual teachings? Um, I think I think so, you know, because if you don't learn a lesson completely, you're forced to relive it. Mm -hmm. And it keeps coming back stronger and stronger and stronger. And you've you've obviously heard about uh, people talking about the, the two by four across the forehead when you don't learn your lesson. Mm -hmm. And then when you think you've learned your lessons, you get the tests. Mm -hmm. And I think that trip back to the Middle East to Oman um, was a test of... Um, you know, maybe forgiveness, um, seeing the humanity in people. That's really what the books are about is, you know, seeing that we're all connected in our humanity and uh, people come from different countries and have different languages and religions. But ultimately, you know, we share the human experience and going back and dealing, you know, with the, the sort of mock trial they put me on and, um, you know, holding me um, was an opportunity to practice compassion and, you know, see people differently. Good for you, man. <laughs> so I guess that trip was a little over three months, right? right. And uh, thankfully, luckily, you landed back in uh, California soil um, safely. Is it, what was your biggest takeaway? Looking back at it now, what do you think was the biggest learning experience from that? Well, there were a lot. Um, I'd like to think that, you know, the, the plane is a powerful tool for, for learning. And, you know, the plane doesn't know boundaries. It, it just keeps flying, you know, mm -hmm. the weather changes and people construct barriers and uh, borders between countries, but it, it doesn't know those. So that's an excellent way to sort of see the mm -hmm. world, you know, to remove the, the borders and boundaries and connect people along the way. It really was a, a mission of oneness on that trip. And you, I, I saw that, I, I felt that mm. in, in through your writing. So you did a good job at reflecting that. In 2017, you made the decision to do another circumnavigation trip. Crazy. What in the world did your family say when you told them that? Well, you know, actually my father's always told me um, that I should uh, not fly and I should get a country club membership and <laughs> just celebrate. Take some up some golf ones. and yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we just, we wanted to keep going, you know, true to our original intention to live the impossibly big dream. We thought, well, what's, what's even bigger? You know, we had uh, on the first trip over a hundred uh, TV interviews and articles and, um, you know, vlogs and blogs and just a lot of exposure. 
But when we were finished with that, um, we felt like there was more work to be done. And when I was doing my graduate spiritual studies, I talked to a guy named Ron Holnick from the University of Santa Monica. And I said, you know, I'm going to go on this trip and I want to tie it into something bigger. And he said, well, how about world peace? And I, I sort of laughed and he kind of laughed because I laughed and I thought that's too big. You know, it's bigger than what I can conceive. But when it came time to do something new, um, we looked at crossing the poles, which a lot of people said was physically impossible with the planes that were available today. And, you know, a lot of them are designed to fly anywhere from about four to six hours. And the South Pole leg, uh, just from Ushuaia to the South Pole and back was 18.1. Now, when you say planes today, you mean planes that can be manned individually? Um, planes that are manufactured, that are out there flying in the world today. Um, I mean, because they have jets that could do that. They have big jets that could do that, right? Right. If you, I mean, you know, four to six hours. There's many flights that are longer than four to six hours. Um, but not in these smaller planes. So, okay. yeah, That's if you take time. a Gulfstream... Uh, uh, 650 ER, you could do that flight. But in the smaller uh, private planes, it's near impossible. Okay. And is it, and is it the, the fact that, there would, that they're single pilot planes or did you have a, an additional pilot the second time? No, I did both trips solo. Okay. Um, there were a couple legs where I took people along. I had a mentor of mine with me uh, for a month in Africa on the last trip. Um, I'm sorry, your question though was, well, let's go back to 2017 when you made the decision that you were going to do another circumnavigation trip. What is the planning that goes into that? Give me an idea of what do you got to do to prepare for something like that? Well, I, I can tell you that if I would have known how hard it was going to be, I would have never done it. Really? I was expecting another six months of prep time like we had done on the first trip. And it ended up being 18 because it was three times harder. We kept identifying additional risks to mitigate. And in some cases, it was beyond the physical capability of the plane. So we had to do over 50 modifications to get that plane that's designed to fly for six hours out to 18.1 in temperatures, you know, way below the freezing point of jet fuel, uh, below the operating point of the uh, engines. Uh, at the south and north poles, uh, GPS doesn't work. So, you know, you layer that onto pilot fatigue, uh, nowhere to land. It just kept getting more and more difficult. I mean, I hear you saying this, and I think, how could anybody that values their life even want to, to embark on such a thing? I mean, that doesn't, those things alone weren't enough to discourage you? Um, well, you know, I was at a stage in my life, or I am at a stage in my life where I wanted to give back. And there's a point where the mission becomes more important than you. Hmm. And, um, you know, we certainly crossed that point. Yeah. What I um, will mention, you know, in the in the final book, uh, Peace Pipe, not the final, but the next book, was we had fuel tanks that burst inside the plane. So there was over 200 gallons of Jet A fuel um, that had come out in the plane. And uh, it remained in the plane, a portion of it for the entire trip. So when you would swallow... Um, you could taste the jet fuel in your throat and then it would burn your eyes and your sinuses. And I got some pretty severe fuel burns when that happened. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> God, Robert, this sounds awful. I just, I mean, I'm so appreciative for the fact that you are a man of integrity and that you really want to see these things through and find a way that you can spread a message of peace. But I got to tell you, as a as a person that cares about you, I was I can only imagine what your family and friends must have been thinking as you were going through these eighteen months of planning, coming up with issue after issue after issue. Did you were you able to do the trip that you had thought, or how much change did you have to do and to accommodate all of these issues that arose? Well, let me tell you first, um, we didn't tell my family what was happening. Oh, I can imagine that. There was uh, very few people that knew, you know, about these things. Um, and we figured that it would um, scare them. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to complete the trip. And, you know, I keep saying we because there was a team of people that supported me. There was mm -hmm. 95 sponsors. Um, I had a board of people, about 10, that were supporting me. Um, we had what we called uh, angels. And um, they would magically appear. 
at um, some amazing times. And um, I remember I would wake up in the middle of the night and I would be journaling because it was getting overwhelming. And at one point I said, um, can't do it. And um, the next day, it was funny, I went to an event and um, these people kept talking about angels. And, um, you know, eventually um, they would offer support. One of them connected us to um, the Smithsonian and the Smithsonian would eventually do a 30 minute segment. Um, resources would start to come in. And, uh, you know, I realized that uh, there was a lot of people Wow. You know, behind it. Wow, that's amazing. It's that's pretty very, emotional. very cool. Sorry. Well, and I can understand. It's making me emotional just thinking about it. Um, the in Zen Pilot, there were quite a few times that you had to rely on people that had much higher technical knowledge about your plane than you did, and without that help, you probably would not have been able to make it through. Um, a friend that was always seemed to be like a call away, which was such a such a cool p- part of the story. Um, how how much when you say we, how much of that team is really a, a technical, you know, mechanical part of the team? Well, certainly we drew together the uh, the best engineers and mechanics we could. Like for example, I did a feasibility study on the. Um, on the citizen of the world before I left. And it was the person who had designed the wing for Gulfstream, mm. who was about to retire in like a week. He was, I believe, 90 years old. And, you know, he came forward and did this last project for us. Um, you know, in a spiritual sense, there were uh, people, my number one, a lady named Susan Gilbert. And um, during the most trying times, you know, she was the one that I would reach out to. And I remember getting ready to uh, depart for the South Pole. And, uh, you know, the winds had changed, which would have me taking off in the direction of the mountains. Um, And the runway was upsloping, so I'd have a little less, you know, speed going. Um, We had been denied permits for Antarctica at the last minute. Um, I'd never flown the plane that heavy before. Uh, I got... um, concerns uh, that were texted to me just as I was walking out to the plane to leave. And it had to do with a Chilean C-130 that um, went down with uh, 36 souls on board a week before. So, you know, there's all these things stacking up. And um, I remember, you know, texting Susan saying, oh my God, you know, this is, it's getting unbearable. And um, the decision, you know, that we made is, you know, let's just focus on safety. And we'll deal with all these other issues that'll arise after the fact. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, again, the mission was important. Yeah. The second uh, trip you did, there was a camera crew that uh, went along to to document your experiences. Those experiences are being made now into a 12-part docuseries, which is very exciting. I said they should do a movie about this, but it looks like a documentary might be faster coming. Um, wh- how did that change the experience to you to have this crew kind of following you around? Um, it changed it dramatically, right? Mm-hmm. Because, um, otherwise it's a very personal experience and I can write about it, but it's a different experience when people can see it happening. Mm-hmm. And we had, uh, cameras on the wingtips of the plane over some really remote parts of the world. Uh, I have, uh, some footage of the North pole and the South pole, you know, counting down, uh, talking to the South Pole, there's a guy named Corey that was um, on the comm station and I was counting down and they had drawn people into the actual um, communication station at the South Pole and they were saying, hey, we've gathered people here. And, um, you know, they were commending me on the flight and uh, I was talking to them and saying how much, you know, I appreciated the risk they were taking too. And it was funny because um, when I uh, requested permission to overfly the South Pole, there was a pause and he goes, um, negative Ghost Rider. And he was referring to Top Gun. And I paused for a second because I knew the new Top Gun hadn't come out yet. <laughs> and I thought neither one of us were going to see it soon because we're over the South Pole right now, you know. Um, so there was a little bit of humor and humanity in, you know, the most remote parts of the planet. But um the uh, docu-series will capture some of that. 
Did you actually have a camera in the cockpit with you? Yeah, sure did. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That, I, I can only imagine because the way you had described the perspiration, the stress, the everything to have that documented on a camera, on camera footage must be amazing. Yeah, you know, it's funny because uh, crossing over the uh, Drake Passage, which is where that Chilean C-130 went down with the 36 uh, people, um, I was running out of fuel mm -hmm. because to get to the South Pole, you have to burn more than half your fuel. And then you rely on the fact that the plane is lighter and faster on the way back. And I was um, counting on having a tailwind as well to help oh, Right, because when you get there, there's no place to refuel, right? Well, I couldn't land. Oh. So, you know, the trip back is the hardest one. And um, over the Drake Passage, uh, I had less fuel than I expected. And I remember sending Susan a text message, I don't think I'm gonna make it. Oh, and um, the solution came by just throttling way back from, you know, almost 300 knots um, back to the speed of a little two seat Cessna mm -hmm. and, you know, riding the wind currents. And um, yeah, it was close. You have to be a very accomplished pilot by now. <laughs> have, is there any situation that you haven't flown in at this point? Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, really? we're always learning and uh, there's always something you know new that's popping up. But, um, you know, those, those chances that I took, um, you know, in hindsight, I would never do that again. But when you're in the midst of it, you just do what you can, you know. You tell a story about uh, getting grounded in Spain and spending some time with some monks. Tell yeah. me a little bit about that story. Yeah, that was a fantastic opportunity. And um, it was just days before they shut the country down you know, for COVID. And um, I was in uh, Montserrat at the monastery, a thousand year old monastery and you know, eating and praying with the monks. And uh, that was probably one of the more magical experiences of the trip because in that monastery, you know, infused in it is a thousand years of meditation. And you would walk into the gardens and you could just feel this like overwhelming energy. And uh, I was living in this small stone room, uh, very fundamental, but all, you know, that you needed. And I remember having a conversation with uh, one of the monks, a guy named Father Tony, and I said, this COVID thing that's developing is this punishment, you know, for people. And he actually kind of, you know, sort of smiled and said, no, this has been happening for thousands of years. You know, there's these uh, diseases and viruses that people have endured and we've become dependent on modern medicine. We think it can fix everything, but it can't. And our humanity or our, you know, longevity, we're, we're not here forever. And we're subject to these things. And with each thing comes a lesson. And for every, I think, challenge, I think there's also an opportunity. And you can see that happening still today, right? Like the environment got cleaner. People uh, started enjoying their pets more. They were focused on the quiet time they had. They realized how little they needed to be happy. They were in a space of gratitude. They had to surrender, you know, in the moment. So many silver linings. Yeah, I, so I, many. I counted so many of them. It actually was my one of my motivations for doing this podcast is because it was so easy, especially if you were listening to the news, which I try never to do, um, to get swept up in the negativity. But I kept looking around me and I'm like, I'm spending more time with my children than I've ever spent. I'm um, focusing on what I have to be grateful for more than I ever have before. I would look outside and the air seemed cleaner than it ever was. And we were hearing about things like the Venice canals running clear for the first time in years. So there were so many silver linings around us. And I think on a experience like that you have, you probably had to constantly be looking for what were, what were the silver linings? Because it would be easy to get bogged down by all of the, the, hard things. I mean, there was a lot of issues that, that you went on on both of those trips. So something had to keep you going, right? And, you know, it's an opportunity to really redefine yourself because in our regular lives, we might say, well, I'm this person who lives in this house and drives this car and has this job, you know, presents well. But when I was by myself in Spain, I realized that I wasn't defining myself by my car, my house, or my job, or the things I was doing, 
I was, in fact, a different person. I was the person who was concerned about my friends, you know, reaching out, um, you know, doing what I could to support them, uh, becoming closer to family members, you know, working through issues that had been around for years. Mm -hmm. So then we see ourselves in a different light. And then you see other people that are suffering in the same way that you are. And you realize that that suffering is part of your humanity as well. I wrote an article at the time about uh, the, the death of your ego during COVID because, you know, you're not defining yourself in the way you did before. So you realize that, well, there's a different person, you know, at the, the heart of all that. So true. I like the way that's put. Yeah. So knowing all that you know now, all of the obstacles, was all of it worth it? Um, it's still developing. Um, I, I think it's definitely, it was worth taking the chances that we did. Um, you know, the resources that were used were enormous to make that happen. Um, but the lessons are still unfolding. I mean, it takes time to sort of sort through everything that happened and uh, pulling other people in and uh, getting their perspective and saying things from you know, a different angle is helping too. I like to say it takes at least a year or two to really fully have the experience. So between um, Peace Pilot and, and the docu-series, do you think that's going to fully um, show what, what you did and, and the outcome that was derived, or, or is that mostly internal? No, I think it's, it's going to be big. Um, for example, uh, the United Nations on World Peace Day, they um, you know, talk about a lot of different things and run some footage. Uh, most people that they... Uh, shared their story with had a minute or two and we submitted 11 minutes and they played 11 minutes oh, of wow. the docuseries um it was on the united nation website and you know it was global so i think when people f- that's pretty cool yeah um we're very proud of that you know because mm-hmm. we've worked so hard but i think when people realize everything that happened because we've held a lot of it back um they're going to be very surprised i think it's going to have some legs to it when is this coming out, man? I can't wait. I hope in the next year. I hope in the next year. We have 72 days of high resolution footage that's been edited down into 12 parts. And, you know, we may start with the documentary or it may be the docuseries. We're still trying to figure that out. Okay. Well, we're, we're standing by, man, waiting to find out. You hold two advanced degrees in spirituality. Um, from the University of Santa Monica. I'm from Santa Monica. I didn't even know there was a University of Santa Monica, just saying. Um, What led you to get a formal degree in spirituality? Most people kind of just do it out on their own. You know, I was on a walk in Balboa Park, and I had been walking in the park for over 10 years. That's where Lindbergh used to go for walks. And I was pretty deep into my spiritual psychology studies, and I was having a moment which is called blissing. So you're experiencing life in a much deeper way than you normally would. And I remember on that walk, um, I could hear the bird. You see Eckhart Tolle sitting on the bench when you... Yeah, for two years, right? (laughs) Um, So I was walking, I could hear the birds chirping. Um, The air was fresh and it was cool. And I could see the light reflecting off the the grass. And I was experiencing sort of a deep sense of peace. And I realized I had never experienced the park in that way before in all those years of walking. And what I came to realize is that I had been numb for all Mm -hmm. that time. And then the next thought I had was, well, maybe I'm numb in my relationships and with my family and and work. And that's when I really decided that I had a lot of internal work to to do. And any success I had in the outside world was to help set me up for that, you know, dive inward. I think most people get to that point at, you know, somewhere in their lives. And um, the message I got was that it was time to give back. It was a time of gratitude. And I basically made a contract with the universe. I said, you know, if, if you can take care of these three things, I'll go out into the world and I'll give back for two years. And one of them was that I had a building that had burned. The other one was I was trying to sell a house for two years and we had a huge number of vacancies. So the business was struggling. And within two weeks, I had an all cash offer on the house. The vacancies went to zero and uh, the building that had burned the insurance company stepped in and gave me a check to pay for it and paid the rents for the next year. And then there was another 
uh, five to six more financial windfalls, you know, tax refunds. Uh, there was a promise to pay for the education that I had just gotten, which came through. One of my buddies who I had lent money to had passed away, his family paid it off. And it was just, you know, within another week or two, um, it was so clear that it, I, I was needing to fulfill my side of the obligation. And that was in 2014. So now we're 2022. So the two years turned out to be much more. I have a feeling it might be a lifetime uh, trek. Are there spiritual teachers that you follow? Ones that you love? You know, the University of Santa Monica, which I think uh, defined my, um, my spiritual practice in a lot of ways, talked about experiential learning. And that meant, you know, having the experience in the world. And certainly there's a ton to be gained uh, in books and lectures and blogs and vlogs and all that. Um, but I believe that a lot of the lessons that um, are for us are out there in the world mm. and uh, getting out, traveling, interacting with people from different cultures, you know, for me, flying is uh, really the best way that I experience those things. It's awesome. Well, having gone through two advanced degrees, um, obviously you did some reading up on the subject. Yeah. <laughs> Which is all positive. What what were the what are the type of classes? I mean, when you're getting a spiritual education, what are some of the classes? I can't even imagine the curriculum. Well, there, there's a lot of them, and each one would concentrate on a particular spiritual concept, mm -hmm. right? So, um, one that often comes to mind is incomplete cycles of action. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, I had a business transaction with somebody, and I really felt. It was actually with my mentor, Susan Gilbert, when our business dissolved, I felt like I had gotten the better side of that deal. Mm. And I went back years later and I said, you know, I keep thinking about this. I want to make it right. So we came to a financial agreement and um, set up some payments. And, you know, I felt contributed the amount that maybe I shouldn't have gotten. Made it more equitable. And um, that I told that story to someone and they said, well, you know, I'd like to invest you know, in, in the business with you. And I said, why would you do that? I just told you, you know, how I did this rotten thing. And uh, she said, well, but you made it right. You know, all these mm -hmm. years later, you went and, and made things correct. So with that, you know, I was able to get another property for the, uh, the business. And you would think that'd be the end of it. Like, that's the reward, right? Well, she told the story to her boyfriend and then he invested. So then that resulted in another property. And by the time it was all done, there was three extra properties. And, you know, the business really is funded in a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Certainly the sponsors have contributed, but the De Laurentiis Foundation has largely been sponsored by the business. And at times, you know, I, I gave instructions that we would bleed it dry until the mission was over. Mm -hmm. um, and now, you know, the foundation is much stronger, as is the business, because of those concepts. I love that. Well, I've, I've been really big on the whole concept of authenticity lately, and I can share experiences like that too, where oftentimes you think by just being super open and honest, we feel like we have to lie to protect people or lie to make ourselves look better. Um, and I'm not talking big lies, I'm talking little white lies that we tell. And yet, if you really try to be fully authentic, people are so impressed and so respect people that will say things that may not even be uh, to their best interest in saying, um, but it wins it over. And that's a perfect example of that, right? Yeah, I like to say when you start reading uh, Flying Through Life, you're not going to like me in the first part. Um, <laughs> there's the reference to Bobby D. Steamroller, a very intense you know, way of uh, handling life. But you know, I think that's why we're here is to learn to love ourselves and getting mm -hmm. past um, some of those issues, you know, those judgments that we have of ourselves, the way we handle things. And then eventually, if you can love yourself, then you can love others. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, I think, try and do it in reverse order. Mm -hmm. That doesn't always work as well as it could. That's so true. So we do a little something here called the big questions. Okay. This is as if we can dig any deeper than you've already dug yourself. <laughs> uh, it's going to be hard. Do you have any consistent daily routines? I do. I, uh, I walk in the park most days. I get up and uh, on the best days, I leave my cell phone behind and I don't really talk. I just walk and appreciate nature and breathe the air and uh, try and live in the moment. 
Are you doing a brisk walk? Is this an exercise? No, no this is a no. this is emotional, spiritual, mental break. Usually lasts for about an hour, hour and a half, and I'll go sit by the fountain um, and just uh, you know think about things that are happening in my life. And it's really interesting because. I remember one time walking and I was uh, had this visualization of like just a cup of tea, right, that you might drink. And I was having good thoughts and the tea was clear. And then all of a sudden I thought about somebody that, you know, I perceived had done some wrong. And then I, I see like this image in my head of milk being poured into the tea and all of a sudden it becomes cloudy. Mm. And in that moment I was like, wow, that's, you know, what happens when you let your mind wander mm. and you focus on these things and then you judge them as bad or wrong. So, I mean, sometimes the lessons are really simple. Other times there's nothing. Um, sometimes you don't even know, you know, what the lesson is, but it's happening. Like you can feel yourself releasing energy. So I think getting out into the nature and connecting is, uh, is a good way for me. Tell me something people would be surprised to know about you. Uh, well, normally I would mention the, that I lived in a monastery for a short time. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to go back to the monastery. Yeah. I think about... Um, what it would be like, you know, to do some time there. You know? Would it be that specific monastery or could any monastery do? I'd like to go back there. That's mm -hmm. a magical place. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel that I had the full experience that I could. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's a place of opening up yourself and um, just dealing with some of life's issues too. Now, is it, are they quiet there? Is it one of those oh, yeah. silent things? Right, you're instructed. Father Tony talked to you a little bit. <laughs> I had to arrange that interview. Um, the thing that I thought was interesting about it was you were encouraged not to talk. Mm -hmm. And somebody might be walking by and they were deep in a meditation. So to talk to them would disrupt that. And mm -hmm. Carolyn uh, Mace says that oxygen is silence for the soul or silence is oxygen for the soul. I think that's very true. So, so what's the purpose of life, do you think? Uh, the purpose of life is to come here and uh, learn to love. And like I mentioned before, loving yourself is an extremely difficult thing to do. People can lo uh, love their kids unconditionally. I see them loving their pets unconditionally. Uh, rarely do you see somebody loving themselves unconditionally. So we've got to figure out how to love ourselves. That's a good good direction That's to start. That's a good start, start right? Yeah. It's a great start. What's a piece of advice that you've been given that you always remembered? The one that sticks with me is I was actually in our Sarsawak, Greenland, and I was talking to another pilot. This was my first time crossing the North Atlantic, and we were in the uh, cafeteria, and they were cooking whale meat, which smells terrible and <laughs> tastes terrible. Um, and it, he he sort of stopped for a second, and he said, you know, He said, no matter how hard it gets, just to not give up and to keep going. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't you know, sure what he was talking about. Like, why did he like suddenly introduce that? And um, at the time I thought it was uh, in a crash situation, you know, because people give up when it, mm -hmm. when it's imminent. And um, I think it applied to much more than that. And we had a, you know, a moment there, um, where he was sharing something really important that I've used, you know, time and time again. And I remember you referencing in, a, in the book quite a few mm -hmm. times as well. So that is something that stuck with you for sure. What is the thing that you think is the biggest pressing issue facing the world today? I think it's the fact that people don't see our connection, you know, between people. And as uh, politics and uh, even go out and say religion, um, the media sort of drive people apart. It's the exact opposite direction that I think we need to be going. Mm -hmm. And getting out and you know talking to people, having face-to-face -face exchanges, you know, the travel, meeting their kids, you know, um, having that human interaction, I think, is the most critical thing because at the end of the conversations or the interactions, you realize that we're all just doing our very best, you know, in the world, having our challenges, and um, that the only way we're gonna do it is together. Yeah. You know, no individual, no corporation, no uber wealthy person is gonna make it happen. It's mm -hmm. everybody. And, uh, you know, as we become a, a global 
uh, economy. There's all these, you know, connections with uh, social media, um, satellite communication, you know, business, uh, global challenges like the plastics in the, the oceans or pollution. One of the experiments that I carried on the uh, citizen of the world was testing for plastic particles in the atmosphere because they found them in the, all the water, you know, bodies of water uh, on all the land, even at the poles, but nobody's ever tested the air. Mm. So that was the first time it's ever been tested. And it just shows that everything is connected. What'd they find? Or what'd you find, I should say? Well, they're still finishing the test, but the uh, initial tests show that there's microfibers in the air and we have them in our bodies too. We breathe mm. them in. Um, and a lot of our clothes, you know, that have the plastics are the source for that sort of thing. So, mm. um, yeah, the environment's connecting us as well. Well, this seems like a rote question for a man like you, but tell me something that you used to believe, but you don't anymore. Um, I used to believe some of the stories that I told myself as a kid. And I actually just learned this the other day. You know, when I was going through high school, uh, I had this expectation of what my life would be, you know, what, what I would accomplish. Um, and by most standards, I, I thought it would just be kind of an average life. And I don't feel like it's been that way. Mm. So, you know, then you realize, well, 50, you know, well, since high school, maybe 40 some years, and I was living with that belief. You know, I believed the story that I told myself and it was not true. So I think it's important for us to define ourselves by who we are right now. And I, you know, recently moved up to the Pacific Northwest and it was a fantastic thing to do because you start your life over again because people meet you and they know you now. They don't know who you were 10 years ago when you were, you know, tackling gang members and doing citizen's arrests or some of the mistakes you made, but, you know, the person that you've evolved to today. So I think it's important to leave those stories behind. And, um, you know, there's a saying, if you're going to tell yourself a story, you might as well make it a good one. Mm -hmm. So I like that. Yeah. Tell me a goal you've yet to reach. Uh, well, what I'd like to do is uh, do the polls nonstop and um, have a plane built that's capable of that. Because in the past, you know, I've taken one and modified it. Um, I'd like to be able to do that circumnavigation nonstop over the poles. I think that would be, it would be a, a first. And we had a lot of firsts on the other trip, but that. Could is, you bring a second pilot for God's sakes, man? <laughs> You need backup. Haven't you figured this out? How about some time to sleep? That would be good too. <laughs> right? I... So you're just wrapping up your second book, Peace Pilot. And... Uh, that's actually technically the fourth book. Fourth book. Yeah. Sorry. Um, when can we expect that to be out? Uh, I think the editing will be done in a couple months. Uh, and then, you know, we're going to do an audio book like we've just about completed with Zen Pilot as well. I think it'll be out on the market in three to six months. Wonderful. Yeah. Ton of work. I'm excited to read it. You talked about that agreement that you made to God to depart part of your life, and you've done so much already. Do you, do you think he's like, okay, you, you did it, we check, or do you feel like you still owe more? No, I feel like... Um... I've been prepared for something much greater. So I don't know what that is yet, but I know it's coming. Wow. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank you. Yours has been an amazing interview, and I love every I loved your book, and I'm looking forward to the next one. So just stay home for a little bit, though. Gosh darn it. I don't know if I can handle it. <laughs> thank you for having me on your show. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Delphine Circle. Don't forget to subscribe. It's free and it will help us keep these incredible interviews coming your way. Here are two other episodes you may enjoy. I'm Delphine. Welcome to my circle.